que la vida se desarrolla en la superficie, debajo de ella. Underground water preserve the flow of rivers, they support whole ecosystems, they dampen the impact of seasonal changes and regulate the effects of climate change. Aquifers know no geopolitical boundaries and their management requires agreements that make sure water keeps flowing. However, the unlimited use of this resource and the pollution caused by untreated waste jeopardize this resource which is vital for life on Earth. CAF, Development Bank of Latin America, invites you to be part of the seventh Water Dialogues, Management and Governance in Aquifers, a space in order to measure the problems and challenges faced by the management and governance of local and transboundary aquifers. Good morning, Latin America. Good afternoon, Spain, authorities, and dear friends. I am Alejandro Macera, Water Director, and let me welcome you all to the seventh edition of Latin America's Spain Water Dialogues that CAP, Development Bank of Latin America, organizes jointly with the Ministry for Ecological Transition and um, Demographic Challenge in Spain with the cooperation of uh, the Minister of um, uh, Economic Business and with the support of Casa America that allows us to broadcast from this wonderful room. This is an event that has become a very important appointment in the calendar of all of us who are engaged in this sector on both sides of the Atlantic. Right now, we are together in order to address a topic which is of utmost importance, the management and governance of underground water. Before we begin with this session, let me indicate to you that you might follow the event on social media with hashtag Dialogos del Agua through the Agenda CAF uh, and water uh, agendas. We also have Portuguese and English simultaneous translation, and you can listen to them through your uh, mobiles. With no further ado, let us begin with the dear Sergio Diaz Granados, Executive President with CAF. Let's listen to the remarks of President Diaz Granados. Let me w warmly welcome you to this meeting. As a tradition, it is done from Casa de America in Madrid. Right now, this is done in a hybrid format and also allow me to especially thank the government of Spain, represented by the third vice president and minister for the ecological transition and the demographic challenge, as well as the secretary of state, Gonzalo Garcia, who is uh, also a partner of CAS and they support us. Uh, so that this high level dialogue, which is so important right now, be done successfully. This is the seventh edition that addresses really important topics as the management of local and national aquifers and the governance of transboundary aquifers. The world is starting to pick up very little, very gradually from the pandemic. In view of the initial uncertainty, the first line of defense has been and continues to be um, hand washing with soap and water, a simple action which was essential and it also highlighted the problems of a fundamental right, the access to drinking water and uh, hygiene. Of course, we need to address fresh water. Only 1% of this resource has to do with irrigations in lakes and 30% come from underground water or aquifers and the rest of it is in the glacial ice sheets. Today we have climate challenges with no comparison. We have an average increase of temperature uh, from the very beginning of the 20th century, which is the main consequence of human action and in general the actions that also have an impact on this variability have a hydrological cycle that represent an increase in terms of uh, coastal 
floods and also droughts that are long in time. Uh, in Latin America, the number of floods in the last 20 years has increased by 80% in relation to the previous 20 years. In this setting, aquifers have an important relevance for water safety and, and climate actions because half of the world population supplies from it and the total amount of water used for agricultural irrigation over 40 percent comes from them here we have space in order to make the most of this agenda in cooperation with spain CAF, latin america and the caribbean to work on important improvements about the knowledge of water available in aquifers and also talk about the growing risk of contamination that are evident in a region that only has 34 percent of the wastewater being treated and the rest is being disposed of with no treatment at all aquifers are essential in order to get uh, climate balance. They provide environmental services for the preservation of fragile ecosystems as well as to keep up the level of swamps, uh, rivers, lakes, among others. Also, they are important for society and the environment, and also they recognize no borders. And apart from being underground reservoirs, they are also space of economic and geopolitical interest with around 600 aquifers and water masses that are over the boundaries throughout the world. The limits are difficult to be addressed as well as the, um, the rights of use. And this takes us to the so-called hydro diplomacy. Latin America and the Caribbean is rich in water resources. Therefore, in CAF, we're supporting countries in order to get uh, some uh, points of encounter, coordination, also starting one of the most important basins in the region of the world, the Cuenca del Plata, that comprises five countries, as well as one of the most important aquifers that we have in the region, the Guarani that uh, comprises four countries in medical sort of both projects hand in hand with the global fund for the environment last let me also mention that climate and environmental realities in the on earth also require a management of these resources in order to cover the, the demands of a sustainable development as well as everything that was said on a national level in countries that are partnering with CAF. We want to become the green bank in the region among other uh, things. We need to increase our funding to go from 26% currently to 40% in 2026. In this way, we also express our effort, our dedication and better tools in order to boost a more inclusive and greener environment. Let me conclude by wishing you the best and tell you that in this space is, uh, where we have specialists in the topic allow us to align effective ways of contributing and having strategic collaborators with one single thing, the sustainable development. That is always on mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks, President Díaz de Gramados. Now, Teresa Rivera, third Vice President and Minister for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge of the Government of Spain, will also give some remarks. It is a pleasure for me to open this edition of Water Dialogues. In the seventh edition, we are going to pay attention to something really very important in our territories, something that we uh, that has a lot to do with water security, water safety, aquifers. How do we work with that? Why should we preserve it? Why diffuse contamination can be a threat? In Spain, 43% of drinking water that we consume comes from aquifers, something that is expanded in the Mediterranean arch where it increases and exceeds. Uh, 40%. Even in the Canary and Balearic Islands, it represents a big amount of water consumption. We know that good quality water, the good state of aquifers is absolutely critical. And it is from the consumption point of view, but also from the water ecosystems and also in terms of preservation of biodiversity. Therefore, the spoil or the excessive extraction of water in aquifers jeopardize some of the most important wonders that we have apart from richness in terms of biodiversity that we are very proud of. That relationship between water, biodiversity and human conformity is absolutely critical. 
It is and will continue to be for a long time, knowing that the consequences of climate change, the risk for an increase in droughts, extreme temperatures will suppose new threats for the preservation of such a great resource. Good management should be integrated jointly with planning, which is the responsibility of water administration in our countries. That's why we need to strengthen, update permanently all management tools also addressing social and environmental matters and putting an important reference from the economic point of view and of course a price for those who have um, bad management or bad conception of aquifers and contaminate without having responsibility or respect that are being demanded by this water masses. But the minister, we're working on a specific plan of action for underground water. We know that we need to address those aspects that are not always well treated within our planning as, for example, a better knowledge, the quality of state of aquifers, also the impact quality and improvement of control practically simultaneously and absolutely transparently together with the information that we have in order to generate knowledge and information and also responsibility by users and the increase of fight against diffuse contamination which is a very important problem that we think has to do with some bad practices that have been um, widespread in our rural areas. Therefore, we want to pass specific regulations in order to uh, strengthen everything that has to do with different types of diffuse contamination and action plans that we want to start in the next few months at different times with different measures, but with special protagonism in 2021. This is not a specific matter that only affects the Iberic Peninsula in Latin America. There are three of the 12 more important transboundary aquifers. Therefore, water safety in many countries in the region depend on the good states in terms of quality and quantity of those water masses. Amazon, Huarani, Irendato, Tarigenio, those are particularly important and the good management and transboundary governance also is. It requires to uh, strive and to improve on the management systems and governance also with transboundary cooperation uh, working on water, something really relevant for populations that depend on those water masses, but also in order to get good quality of ecosystems that are living thanks to that underground water. Also having regulations that in a harmonized manner foresee a good management, having participation systems and consensus making systems among different administrations, communities, and uh, countries is fundamental. Therefore, I'm sure that in this edition, as in previous ones, in these editions of water dialogues, we will see very interesting proposals. We will see experiences that will prove how to um, improve the management of our water richness, but also some other experiences that will help us understand what we need to prevent in the following years. Thank you very much to all of you for your participation in uh, September seventh edition in our cooperation in such a critical topic, so important topic as water. Thank you very much for your participation, Mrs. Vice President. Up next, we will greet Mr. Gonzalo Garcia Andres, Secretary of State for the Economy and Business Support in Spain. Mr. Secretary of State, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alejandro, dear Vice President, dear President and Vice President with CAF. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, President of CAF and Vice President Asinelli for the recent election. It's a pleasure to be part of the seventh edition of Water Dialogues organized each year by CAF together with the government of Spain. Right now, as has already been explained by the President and Vice President, 
The topic are the challenges presented by aquifers. This is a fundamental resource as a priority source of water and economic resource, and it's fundamental in sustainability politics to fight climate change. I read in some of the uh, CAF documents that 50% of the world population drinks underground water daily. This proves the importance of such a resource and also the importance of the management and leverage. I would like to thank also to all of you for the work done in order to renew the MOE between CAF and the Ministries of um, Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge in order to continue boosting activities for sustainable development and well-being of citizens in such a fundamental environment that has such an important space within the development cooperation policy in Spain and also within the priorities of Spain and different institutions as our uh, water resources. We are aware about the difficulties that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused in the economies in the region. We understand and have supported during the pandemic CAF strategies to get involved in funding uh, the budget and also the credit lines to private banking in emergency situations. In such situations as the one we've been experiencing, public and multilateral institutions need to react promptly and adapt the objectives and their instruments in order to protect citizens. However, CAF is an essentially financial integration institution with an important role in the development of Latin America, and this is fundamental for Spain. So we would like to see that the institution goes back to the funding of national investment projects compatible with the fight against climate change and also regional integration projects that affect many member countries. And the management of aquifers, as has been said before, has this element of being an integration project, cooperation project of joint management. In this sense, we uh, support integration management for the unification of uh, tax distribution, also the simplification of the transboundary management, and particularly the plurinational tapping of water and the development of renewable energy. So this common resources where we cannot have an effective and sustainable uh, use with no cooperation. And without forgetting the boost of uh, technology and technological devices in order to strengthen that integration process. So with all of these efforts, honestly, the Spanish experience both in public management, in the management of hydrological confederations and in terms of businesses as well, might be of great use. And we are delighted that through these dialogues and through some other instruments, we are able to share our experience and also be able to learn from the other experience in Latin America. In terms of water tapping within the framework of the close collaboration with CAF that has been reinforced today with this renewal of the MOE, we've MOU, sorry, we've been identifying different opportunities to support Latin America and the Caribbean in providing the supply and improving the management of such an essential resource as water, which is a fundamental resource for the short term in order to develop the economy, but also especially to move on towards a transition of a more sustainable economic model. We are exploring several initiatives that will allow us to strengthen the management capabilities of uh, service providers in Latin America, as for example, one we are working on right now in order to deploy a technical assistance um, between uh, water uh, service providers in both regions in order to exchange experience, lessons learned in view of similar challenges. This initiatives to share our knowledge and experience are really useful in order to, I mean, apart from the financial resources, in order to facilitate the spread of knowledge of experience and also be able to move faster within our goals. CAF strategy should be coordinated with that of some other multilateral institutions that are active in the region as a World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank.
That coordination needs to be done at a multilateral level in order to facilitate the management capability as well as the absorption on the part of national economic uh, institutions that as well as some others, including ours, we've been subjected to um, extraordinary uh, test of resistance during the pandemic. Spain is also willing to act as a bridge in the region, between the region and Europe. You can count on us in order to facilitate the approach of CAF with the European Investment Bank and the European Commission now that it meets the eligibility criteria for the community budget. Also, as you know, Spain has representation in governance bodies of the main World Climate Funds, and here we can also act as a bridge between them and CAF. And green projects can be designed in the region in cooperation with these funds. Let me conclude by reiterating my appreciation to CAF and also wishing this seventh edition of Water Dialogues to be very fruitful, that leaves us with lots of experience and uh, teachings which allow us to improve the design of our policies and strategies for the better tapping of water resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary of State, for your intervention. And now we are going to start the program with the seventh edition of Water Dialogues. You know that water and the waters contribute to irrigation and one third of the, of the water used in the industry. They are the sustain for ecosystems and they preserve the base flow of irrigation and stabilize ground. Aquifers also dampen the impacts from seasonal changes and climate variabilities as reservoirs. All these values expose their relevance in the use and conservation of the resource. Latin America presents many challenges ahead in this matter. So to know the strategic view of the aquifers in the region, we give the floor to Cristian Asinelli, Corporate Vice President of Strategic Programming CAF. Mr. Asinelli, you have the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon here in Spain, in Europe, and in Latin America, and in the Americas. It is a great pleasure for me to participate at this seventh water dialogues that give us the opportunity to keep on reflecting upon the link that water assumes for Latin America and Spain, particularly in such a relevant topic as aquifers and underground waters are, as our executive president said, and the government secretary, and also I think the words of Gonzalo Garcia. So. Nobody doubts about the fact that water is a first order strategic resource globally for Latin America, for the Caribbean, that has 30% of the water resources in the planet and is in a privileged situation. However, our region also presents important asymmetries as regards distribution in areas where we find abundant water and other areas where scarcity is extreme. So this resource is a resource that we need to take good care of. And as was said before, between 40 and 60% of the water used in Latin America comes from aquifers. So this water, which is used for human consumption and for irrigation, and also in Central America and in Mexico, where dependence is greater, estimated above 65%. So aquifers for Latin America and the Caribbean offer a singular 
characteristic, and it is its dampening capacity in view of climate change what is important. It can tolerate long periods of droughts, particularly in arid or semi-arid areas. And this situation is more evident because aquifers are essential for the water security of the region and also contribute to food security. We can also talk about energy security as well, because we can use underground waters and also superficial waters for issues related to power generation. Therefore, keeping aquifers in good condition has implications in the biodiversity of ecosystems that depend on them, including springs, wetlands and forests as well. Aquifers, as we all know, are not static and go beyond, as was said at the opening of this event, the geopolitical borders of countries. As the president of CAF said, over 600 aquifers across border all over the world and over 60 are located in Latin America. As the vice um, president said, some in the Amazon, the Guarani aquifer and others which are so important for the management of this important resource for all Latin Americans and Caribbeans. So it is clear the strategic value that aquifers have for the region as a whole and also for each and every country in it because the intensive use of this resource and this has been very much documented has contributed to imbalances risking the sustainability of this water source Therefore, I would like to point to three big threats that we observe and from CAF we consider must be addressed. Overexploitation, contamination, and clearly climate change. Overexploitation is characterized by a greater extraction of water than the natural loading of water, and this has to do with what happens in the region. In an increasingly number of documented cases showing the negative repercussions and impacts that we are seeing, for example, the saline intrusion in these aquifers, this is a threat we must address altogether. Another threat that is more generalized in the region and in the world and we know of is the contamination of aquifers due to the discharge of wastewaters from cities, from the industries or mining in the informal sector. And the third threat due to climate change that worsens climate variability with rainfall periods that are more concentrated and high rainfalls reducing this availability and thus causing problems in the charging of the aquifers. All these threats call our attention on certain aspects. First, greater knowledge, greater institutional capacity to manage the use of water resources. Consequently, based on this need, and as our executive president said, CAF has been supporting a series of projects, such as the project of the strategic program for the Guarani Aquifer and many other projects that we are working on with the countries in the region. And to conclude, I would like to point to the deep commitment that CAF has towards water resources in the region within the framework of the water uh, strategy that we've been carrying out for long and that we evidence in this seventh water dialogues, as well as the institutional will, as our president said, to transform CAF in the green bank of Latin America and reiterate our commitment as Mr. Gonzalo Garcia said, that this bank must work and again on investment projects for the region. And I would like to conclude with two challenges that we have ahead. And I think they are key. First, what everybody knows, aquifers are a strategic resource for countries and for region as a whole. And these calls that other countries, that our countries 
provide more resources to fully understand the real capacity and condition of aquifers you know carrying out studies research studies monitoring systems as well as tools that are more modern for modeling and prediction and second in the case of cross-border aquifers due to the importance of making the best use of them on the principles based on the principle of equality we require to go deeper into a concept raised by our president water diplomacy this is a concept that CAF has been pushing forward where we think we can address a good and important challenge of interaction of all countries, Spain and Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean. This assumes dialogue, cooperation, engagement that leads to long term agreements. I am very thankful to all the authorities who are present here for opening this space which are clearly the results of the relationship between Latin America and Spain, between CAF and the countries in the region in order to create a framework so that our agenda, which we believe, we believe is a future agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean, can become one of the most important agendas to benefit millions of Latin Americans and Caribbeans. Thank you very much. And we continue with the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Asinelli, for this approach that you have given us. And now we continue with the global panorama of aquifers. We have Nemo Kukuric, director of the International Center for the Assessment of Underground Water Resources, IGRAC UNESCO. Mr. Kukuric is going to share with us a discussion framework for future sessions. So, Mr. Kukuric, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Pleasure because uh, you decided to talk uh, about groundwater, and uh, uh, I'm also uh, delighted uh, hearing uh, previous speakers, and uh, obviously. Uh, there is so much knowledge and awareness already uh, about uh, groundwater in the region. And today we are going to have uh, two panels uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, knowledgeable, esteemed colleagues. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite sure that we will have very fruitful discussion on groundwater uh, in, uh, in Latin America. What I would like uh, to do just in a uh, quarter of hour is to give you uh, a global, a short global perspective uh, about groundwater, uh, state of groundwater resources, and uh, I will give a special emphasis on uh, internationally shared aquifers. Can I go to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, I can do it. Great. So, uh, just to say that I'm, I'm coming uh, from IGRET, which is a uh, uh, UN affiliated uh, uh, international groundwater center, the only global uh, groundwater center. So, uh, our colleagues already uh, said quite a lot about facts which we know about the importance of uh, groundwater. Groundwater not only supplying uh, us with the drinking water and supplying agriculture and industry, but also the importance of groundwater for ecosystems, for uh, uh, rivers, uh, to uh, preventing uh, seawater intrusion, uh, land subsidence, uh, and uh, 
Uh, last speaker uh, also mentioned the importance of groundwater for climate change adaptation. Uh, we also know that uh, groundwater is often uh, a solution for people without uh, access to safe uh, water, and that's, that is still one uh, of six people uh, around the world. Despite all these uh, facts which we uh, have, uh, groundwater is still out of sight and out of mind of most people. And that's not the wonder, because imagine that there is no rain, that, that never rains. Imagine that there are no rivers, that there are no lakes. Imagine that there are no seas and oceans. It's very difficult to imagine, impossible. But now imagine that there is no groundwater. And that's, uh, that's uh, our challenge of uh, having invisible and very important resource. So we all know that water scarcity is affecting a lot of people all over the world and it's increasing. Uh, we all know that surface water availability is decreasing because of our activities and climate change and uh, our uh, reliance and on groundwater and pressure on groundwater is growing. Still, we don't know sufficient about the groundwater resources and we do not manage uh, our aquifers well enough. I will not talk much about groundwater quality. Just look at this uh, uh, report, recent report of the World Bank uh, about water quality, invisible water crisis, and they said, unfortunately, uh, for one region of the world, we don't have groundwater data, and we couldn't say anything about groundwater. That's really a, a very serious situation. So how to tackle this? Well, we need this vital resource to be sustainable according to sustainable development goals of the United Nations, goal six, six on clean water and sanitation. To do that, we need to manage groundwater in an appropriate, sustainable way. To have informed management, we need a good assessment and monitoring of groundwater resources because they are changing. And because Groundwater is invisible. We need to invest more in this outer circle. So, in information knowledge sharing, awareness, synergies, partnerships, exactly what uh, we are doing today. Just to say very briefly about the importance of groundwater monitoring, it is a large initial investment. But we can't do assessment or prediction without monitoring. And regarding assessment of groundwater sources uh, in general is that assessment is always uh, multidisciplinary. We need to take into account uh, environment, socioeconomic aspect, legal, institutional, etc. So to put groundwater in this broader context. Only then we can explain the importance of uh, groundwater and take it uh, uh, on board. Now, on transboundary aquifers, most of the countries share uh, aquifers, and these changes, potential changes in groundwater quality and quantity, can lead to international problems, but also this can be a platform for cooperation and to eliminate problems and to uh, increase overall benefit for groundwater. There are a lot of programs and, and organizations dealing with uh, this issue, but please uh, remember ISA of uh, UNESCO and uh, International Association of Hydrogeologists is very active in, in Americas. So we started just 20 years ago with the first inventory of uh, transboundary groundwaters in Europe, and uh, then uh, in Asia, you see still 
just the circles and ovals, Central Asia and Caucasus. And you see, for instance, in Africa, that we started in 2002, just the circles. And in 2012, we had delineated most of the actors in Africa. In 2015, thanks to the contribution from colleagues from all over the world, we uh, produced the first map of transboundary actors of the world. Nowadays, we have uh, interdisciplinary methodology we can use. We can uh, we have a legal framework also used for the Guarani actor system, for instance. And we have also information system and all this information online available for everyone who deals with the with the uh, transboundary ground borders. So um, this was financed uh, mostly by Jeff uh, Global Environment Facility, and Jeff financed also a number of individual projects, uh, also at Guarani, and it was a, a very successful project. And I heard that. Uh, now, second phase uh, is uh, uh, coming, so I'm uh, very, very happy about that. Uh, globally, uh, if you look large aquifers, most of the large aquifers are uh, under stress are transboundary. And that's, uh, that's very uh, important to remember. If we are talking about challenges of transboundary groundwaters, I would like to stress that um, uh, it's very important to uh, do a, a right prioritization because we have a large aquifers, uh, you know, like what I mean, and where we should concentrate our, our efforts. We, we can't really uh, assess in detail the whole aquifer and, and manage it uh, everywhere. So we need to take all these uh, current and, and future uh, elements in account and uh, to, to make a, a, a right uh, decisions and characterize. I'm also, I'm almost uh, rounding off, coming back to, to management from assessment and uh, wanted to uh, emphasize that we need to go out the box, uh, not only in terms of new technological solutions and uh, uh, to, to look at the other fields like agriculture and even serious gaming uh, uh, industry, but especially to uh, see how we are investing and how we can uh, provide uh, additional incentives to uh, investors to engage not only in production process, but in the whole uh, catchment area because uh, their uh, contribution to the management of the whole catchment of the whole aquifer is the only way to uh, provide, to ensure sustainable use of uh, aquifer, not just production process. Conclusions. Well, some of the conclusions uh, I made uh, during the presentation, that one on groundwater monitoring and uh, importance of monitoring of, of a broader societal and environmental context where we need to put the groundwater in on multidisciplinary approach and framework of international protocols use local uh, culture and uh, uh, customs and uh, 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 and assist with uh, uh, international frameworks. Keep fostering international cooperation. Climate change and, and human impact of groundwater, groundwater resources do not stop at administrative borders, any kind of the borders. So as we are actually putting more pressure and climate change as well on groundwater resources, international cooperation and knowledge sharing is the only way. So, only by working together, we can substantially increase visibility and improve state of uh, these precious uh, resource. At the end, uh, I would just like to uh, uh, say that next year we will have a chance 
to actually make groundwater more visible because the United Nations decided to dedicate next year to groundwater. So we will have a World Water Day on groundwater. Uh, there, there is a United Nations World Water Development Report uh, under preparation on groundwater. We will have groundwater summit on groundwater, uh, uh, summit on groundwater next year. So it will be plenty of opportunities and uh, a right framework to make groundwater uh, more visible. I thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias por su presentación. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Kukuric. And after these very interesting presentations that are the contextual framework, we will now get into first dialogue that has to do with the challenges in the sustainable management of local aquifers. Specifically, will we be addressing over exploitation and the effect in pollution by untreated waste in the source of origin to speak about these matters that are so relevant in the management of local aquifers, we have a panel of experts that will be addressing the most relevant aspects when uh, sustainably um, tapping the source of fresh water. Let me remind you that you can follow this event in social media, follow the agenda of CAV and water, uh, and also participate with hashtag uh, water dialogues or dialogues del agua. Let me invite the guests of this panel with the moderator, Jorge Concha, Director of Analysis and Technical Evaluation of Sustainable Development with CAF, and panelist Teodoro Estrella, Water General Director from Mitterd in Spain. Mr. Concha and Mr. Estrella are uh, here present in the room and remotely we uh, want to greet Victor Gourvet, General Director of the Valley of Mexico Basin Agency and Armand Vargas, Subdirector of Hydrology in Colombia. Moderator, you have the floor. Thank you, Alejandro. It's a pleasure for me to present to you this session about the challenges in the sustainable management of local aquifers. Good morning, Latin America and the Caribbean, and good afternoon for all of you here in Spain and Europe. The sustainable management of local aquifers presents a series of challenges, among which we've already been uh, hearing about in the previous presentations uh, that have a very clear problematic that has to do with the amount of water and therefore the over exploitation of water. It also has to do with the quality of that water. It also has to do, as our vi corporate vice president with CAV uh, reminded us, it has to do with the reality of climate change. And in order to understand those challenges, it's also important to be able to balance and um, understand the differences and the commonalities and the imbalances in terms of the exploitation of some resources that are finite and are also vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis the expectation and the needs that are quite real but are quite relevant at a global level both for the household use as well as for the productive use in order to discuss about those challenges and also in order to present some solutions, allow me to um, speak with three experts. Apart from being experts, they also hold uh, an important and authority position in the different countries and allow us to very well complement the global and regional perspective presentations such as that of Neno Kukuric uh, talked about the reality of aquifers and allow us to uh, extrapolate that reality to very specific perspective 
perspectives in terms of uh, the local aspect of certain countries such as Spain, Mexico, Colombia, and also from some complementary perspectives in that sense. With me today is Victor Burguet, General Director of the Valley of Mexico Basin Agency. He belongs to the Conagua. Uh, National Commission of Water, uh, civil engineer, and he's been working and holding important positions, being general director of the Mexican Institute of Water Technology, among other things. He's also a professor and researcher. Also, we have this perspective uh, from the basin, which will be offered by Mr. Victor Burguet, and also with us are, is Mr. Teodoro Estrella, Water General Director of the Ministry uh, for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge in Spain, also engineer of roads and ports. Um, he has been holding very important positions in the state here in Spain for over 30 years. And in a research support uh, perspective with us today, also virtually, we have Mr. Omar Vargas, Subdirector of Hydrology of the Hydrology, Meteorology, Environmental Studies Institutes of IDEAM, subscribes to the Ministry of Environment in Colombia. Mr. Omar Vargas, he's a geologist with a PhD in water resources at the University of Columbia, as well as a professional researcher, professor specialized in hydrology with great amount of publications made and uh, his professor in several universities. I would like to begin, first of all, with a transversal question for the guests the panelists of this session, and it has to do with what Neno Kukuru was also saying in his presentation, how to make the invisible visible. He said that we have a resource that supplies with drinking water to have the population globally. However, there are important problems for its management also in order to make the role and the value of aquifers visible. So how can we make this resource visible, a resource which is strategic, and also be able to balance these real needs with a reasonable preservation a considerate preservation in terms of a finite and vulnerable resource. I would like to begin with the Mexican reality. So let me invite Mr. Burguet to tell us from his own perspective, how can we make this resource more visible and what are the actions that we have at our disposal? How are you handling this in Mexico? Victor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Jorge. Thank you, CAF, for inviting us to be part of this seventh water dialogue and also sharing some of our experience. Let me begin due to my academic training many years in the Institute of Water. Let me begin by treating water in urban areas. I think that in the academic environment, there is a lot to be done because our training, at least some people in my own generation and some following generations, we work on large waters, on large works dams, aqueducts, irrigation uh, stands. And so we were very much used to having a lot of water and not thinking about the fact that it could be limited in its use. We address urban uh, hydrology, etc. However, I believe that hydrology, especially underground hydrology, was quite minor in the academic training that we got. And only recently we became to learn in the 80s onwards of the abuse that we've made on aquifers that has become more relevant right now but we don't yet give it the value it has. A good example of this is what we have here at the Valley of Mexico. We'll get into that, but let me just tell you that 72% of 
The supply to the 22 million inhabitants in the valley comes from the uh, aquifers of the area. And of course, you all know this, at least in the region, they know that we have an overexploited aquifer. It is measured, but it's not really well measured. Therefore, in order to make it visible, we need to start with the training of our specialists, our engineers on these topics and let them see that this is quite relevant thing. What else can we do in order to make it visible? Fortunately, with climate change, we are having very intense uh, rainfalls. And at the beginning of this year, in 2021 in Mexico, there was a large drought. But today, in the central and southern area of the region, we are fighting against rainfalls. And so they has put water on the forefront and we have to make the most in order to make this problem more visible. And people need to uh, get used to many of the things that we need to implement right now. What are the actions that we can do in order to make it more visible? Maybe spread in uh, the availability that we have in terms of aquifers here in Mexico. We have very good regulation, a very stringent one at the Californian style, as I call it. However, economically speaking, it's not feasible. We also need to reuse water, at least in these regions. In Mexico, as you know, if it weren't because of hurricanes, it would be a desert. So we, we don't start to pay more attention to reuse of water than only 3% of water is being reused here at the Valley of Mexico, then it would not be feasible towards the future, reducing the demand in terms of uh, 200 liters per inhabitant. It's also some, it's a must in the Valley of Mexico and also in most of the northern area of our country. And I guess that many regions of the world ha are suffering from the same thing. Also increase the efficiencies of our drinking water networks implement the reloading of aquifers with a better regulation also the use of green infrastructure that is also another topic that will probably have to be done in the future these are some of the actions that we believe that if we don't implement we will be a commit in the future of our children our future generations this is all i wanted to say thank you very much victor this is absolutely relevant. I mean, the perspective that you mentioned from Mexico. Now I'd like to continue with the Spanish reality. Teodoro, maybe you can share from your own point of view how to make the invisible visible. How can we make this resource visible both at a public level and at a populational level? Thank you very much, Jorge. First of all, let me thank CAF for their invitation to this seventh Water Dialogues. I am really honored being here. In terms of your question, how to make this resource visible, we clearly see this, even though this is our resource that it seems that it's invisible. We make it visible when we uh, produce the discharge to rivers, when the discharge is done uh, in different uh, currents or in wetlands. In uh, Spain, we do have some of these areas that due to the exploitation of aquifers are being uh, jeopardized and are also compromising the well-being of those areas. And also uh, streams that with the use of water in the 20th century are also uh, something to pay attention to. These are elements will, that will help us make underground waters more visible. In our country, the use of underground water is around 25%. This might not seem very large, but a fundamental resource in Spanish territories where we have the greatest water imbalances among the resources available, the demands and environmental requirements. Therefore, we need to uh, take care of this resource. Approximately 40% of our underground water masses, our aquifers are not in well state for various reasons, over exploitation, pollution, especially diffuse pollution caused by agriculture. So this is the main use of this type of waters in Spain. Approximately in the use of underground waters, it's a 1,500 uh, cubic hectometers, and 
also they are used for irrigation purposes. So how can we make society, people, administrations be aware about the importance of this resource? by showing the situation, showing that if we don't properly use underground water, if we don't extract less water than the available resource in underground water, then we will have problems. It will affect our rivers. It will affect our wet areas. It will affect the streams that will no longer have the flows that they used to have. But if we apply fertilizers, then we will have uh, nitrate pollution or contamination as we do have in some of the aquifers. And to, for that, I think that it's essential that society is aware of the importance of this resource at the very beginning invisible, that, but I think that it is made visible when the discharge is made on waters and wet areas or even when it is out to the sea. Thank you very much, Teodoro. I would like now to make the same question to Mr. Omar Vargas. What is the Colombian perspective with over 60 aquifers in the whole territory and also many of them transnational? So you have a key relevance for the supply, for irrigation. So how can you make this resource visible and what are the actions and the conditions required? Good morning to all of you here in Colombia. Special greeting to CAF and organizers, especially our uh, partner Sergio Diaz Granados that's taken the precedences in September. A lot of success in that. And in terms of your question, as you were saying, Colombia is a country that has very special conditions. The first of them is that this is the sixth country in the world with larger superficial uh, water uh, performance. So the use of underground water until now has been partial. This is not an intensive use. It's a use that it's focus on certain specific regions with some availability restrictions in terms of underground water that are quite a few in Colombia. In the country, the demand of water resources of 16 billion uh, cubic meters uh, per year, and out of this total demand, only 10 to 15 percent is from underground water. However, in the last few years, given the conditions of climate variability and climate change, we've seen a need to start to set a joint use uh, strategies and um, artificial refill and also reuse of those waters, especially in the agricultural sector, which is the one that has the greatest demand in Colombia. In order to make that resource more visible, a resource which has been called invisible, we need to think that first of all, we need to understand the aquifer systems that see where they are, what's the geometry, the flow dynamics, what are the hydraulic conditions, what are the vulnerability conditions, also the impact that it may have due to uh, pollution or stress by use. So first of all, we need to learn to know, and this is a work for the academia and institutions in order to offer enough information that will allow us to get that knowledge. Part of that knowledge is monitoring, the permanent monitoring of underground water, but also the uh, spread of the monitoring results of different variabilities, different qualities of various uh, aquifers in order to have real-time knowledge about the status and dynamics of our aquifer systems or the main aquifer systems. The other point that also allows for visualization is the formulation and implementation of environmental management plan for aquifers. Those plans allow us to have like a roadmap 
in terms of a desired future and vis-a-vis -vis the actions and strategies that need to be developed in order to get the sustainability of aquifer systems. It's important to mention that we need to make these plans end up being agreements with players, social players, institutional players, union players. Those plans that don't lead to agreements set with society in the end are plans that have a lot of wording but little action. So we need to guarantee those agreements. The other point has to do with information systems. The monitoring and knowledge results need to get into information systems so as to be able to democratize information and put it at the service of all social union or institutional players. And here we talk about something very important, communication, how we are going to communicate at various national, regional, local levels to the academia, to the community in general, and ethnic communities, etc. How will we talk about underground waters? The role of communicators is really fundamental and it's uh, very relevant in terms of managing aquifers. Let me conclude by saying that in order to do all this, Three elements are really important. One, I've already mentioned it, the roadmap, which are the uh, environmental management plans for aquifers and also national plans in the case of Colombia, the national plan of underground water. Also, uh, trained and skill a human talent. The big problem that we have is that there are very few people with the uh, proper level of knowledge on hydrogeology and underground water. So we need a train and skill human talent, not only at a national level, but also at the level of regional institutions. And we need budget, a budget that will allow us to expand the borders of knowledge, improve and strengthen monitoring aspects, implement environmental um, management plans for aquifers and also have information systems for all players. I believe that um, this is what I have to say for this specific question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. Now I would like to continue with the second round of questions and also start with Victor. You were saying in the previous answer that the aquifer at the Valley of Mexico is uh, one with a very important problem of over exploitation, and that over exploitation is also linked and uh, restricted to a very large current demand. You were mentioning 73% of water supply that was done based on the aquifer. In this sense, in view of this very large demand, but in view of this over-exploitation situation that does not allow, according to the recent reports from Kanawa, to give new licenses for exploitation, but rather uh, uh, you have a possible situation of deficit. Victor, let me ask you, what are the actions that you have been implemented or what do you plan to implement in the future in Kanawa from the Basin Council in order to respond to this situation? Thank you, Jorge. And it's so good that you asked me. Starting with this topic, which I think is the most relevant, not only in the city, but in the country as a whole, for the first time in history, we are taking this licensing scheme seriously. In Mexico, water is a property of the state and it is granted to users through licenses. And this has led to many undue and improper situations. We have a public registry of users with many irregularities. And for the first time in history, I think that people are taking this seriously and we are starting to put this in order. Of course, there are many problems to it, but one of the 
best decisions made by the Conagua agency in this administration is to put the house in order and set a limit. We are working on many aspects to regularize this situation. We will be able to put some things in order to recover some aspects. It will not be enough because the um, situation is very important. As part of the National Water Program, we are planning to recover spaces to preserve lakes. As you know, the Valley of Mexico is composed of five lakes. So we are working to recover these areas. Ever since the Spanish came to Mexico in the colonial times, these issues come from far. So we have in the Valley of Mexico, through infrastructure, we are working on the infrastructure and thanks to the effort and tunnels that are being built, we are gaining spaces. We are recovering water storage spaces to facilitate the charging of the aquifer. We have recovered some spaces in the lake, in Chaminilco, in Hilco, in the south of the valley, the lake to the north, and this is a relevant aspect, not just because we have a quality, but also quantity problem. As my partners said, we are working to improve the treatment of the waters. And the future of the city, which is to increase the reuse of the resource, particularly for the industry, trade, and green spaces for irrigation, and then leave as little water as possible for human consumption, trying to reduce consumption, which currently is around 180 liters per inhabitant per day. So we are also working on other aspects, natural charging. Well, we are implementing a series of small infrastructure works that we have to the east and west of the valley, and this will help us recover part of the rainfalls that we are getting, which are quite problematic in some areas. Also, the porous pavements that improve the aquifer um, dynamics and the treatment of water. We have a big plant outside the Valley of Mexico for waste treatment and irrigation. So part of that water, we are trying to get recovered. And once we have a more flexible standard for the artificial refill of the aquifer, we will work on that. Another initiative is the design of the new airport of Santa Lucia that will have also um, a more um, modern and efficient aquifer refilling um, system. Also in other parts of the Valley of Mexico, we are working so that the rainfalls in that area can be recovered and help us reduce the problems that we have. We need to bring water from other sources, uh, which is very costly. Thank you, Victor, very much. And I would like, Teodoro, if you will, to keep on talking about physical measures like Victor was describing from the reality of Mexico. But in the case of Spain, what are the actions and measures related to the measurement, the knowledge and the reporting aspects? Omar was telling us how relevant it is for an adequate sustainable management to have timely information, but also democratize that information with the rest of the stakeholders. So what are the measures that you are taken, you are taking in order to provide 
more information from the metered in Spain in terms of quality, quantity, opportunities. Well, the measures that we are taking in our country in Spain, first, access to information on underground waters, trying to promote information systems which are available on the websites of basin agencies. So any citizen should be able to see the evolution of an aquifer in terms of size, quality of the water, parameters of the water. And that information is available on the websites and it's something possible, some, something viable. So the first thing we need to do is to know the state of things to make right decisions. Another measure that I think is vital in our country is the water planning. This is the essential tool that we have to attain our goals. On the one hand, meeting demand in a sustainable manner, and on the other hand, reaching environmental goals. So I would say that basin plans need to define the resource allocation, in this case, allocation of underground waters for the various uses of water. Next, licenses are granted, but the allocation of water resources is made on the planning stage. The planning stage also defines environmental goals, the aquifer levels that we need to have, the quality parameters that we need to attain, and also the measures that will help us attain all those objectives. So I would say that the water resource planning is the fundamental instrument ever since 1985. This has a regulatory net, uh, nature. Also in Spain, underground waters uh, belong to the public domain. And this is another important characteristic for the management of this resource. And then, given the importance of underground waters in some territories of Spain, and given the fact that we still don't have all the aquifers in good conditions from the quantitative or chemical perspectives, we have launched an action plan on underground waters referenced by the Vice President Teresa Rivera in her presentation. And this action plan has several elements. First, improve the knowledge of the water geology, geology of the water dynamics of aquifers, the pollution of aquifers, so on and so forth. Spain made a great effort at the end of the 20th century to improve knowledge on aquifers. And we wanted to improve knowledge that we have on aquifers this year, next year. Another element is measurement. We have many meters in our country. As part of this action plan, we have launched an ambitious program to improve the metering networks and the quality of the waters in all aquifers with the purpose that we have uh, meters and quality meters in each aquifer. And these would be points of control that would allow us to also monitor the levels of underground waters and superficial waters in the right manner. And this is a challenge we have in the future to significantly improve the metering schemes for our networks. And we also have other aquifers which are not in a good state. Sometimes the level of water use causes over exploitation uh, or the use of pesticides also opens the door to toxic or uh, hazardous substances around. So we need to have mathematical models in quality and quantity that allow us to understand the relationship between the underground masses of water and the state of the underground water. These are the measures that we need to take in order to revert this situation. 
and reach the greatest wish that we have been able to finally have a good water uh, scheme in place with a good monitoring and a good state. Thank you, Teodoro. Thank you very much. And these are the measures as you are describing. This is the public information, public knowledge that we need. And with this, I would like to ask Omar, your institution related to knowledge technical scientific advisory, the IDIAM Institute in Colombia. So you as relevant instruments, how you support decisions, how you advocate the measures taken in the country. So I would like to ask you, Omar, what are the lessons learned, but also what are the opportunities for improvement in terms of tools for measuring that you have? And also, how can we improve those same, those same tools and instruments to provide a better support to the information systems? Thank you very much. Well, I would like to emphasize the uh, instrument, which is the National Program of Underground Water. This program is part of the water public policy for the integrated management of water resources that was established by the ministry in Colombia in 2010. So there we started implementing the program on underground waters of 2013 that gathers each and every element that my colleagues here in the panel have talked about. The need to expand the border of knowledge that we made reference to already, the importance of research and training which is sometimes one of the limitants that we have in our staff and personnel whenever we work on these matters. The issue of monitoring and assessment. And also there is another instrument in Colombia, the Institutional Regional Water Monitoring Program. This program establishes actions and strategies for the monitoring of water, uh, both at national level and also at regional level. In Colombia, there are 33 environmental units in large urban centers, and they have the responsibility for implementing these regional programs. Another element is the implementation of the environmental aquifer management plans in order to work on the things that I mentioned before, communication strategies, and also we need to put underground water on the agenda of management and decision making at regional and national level, particularly our uh, most important body, which is the National Water Council. So all these actions are part of our framework and we have many lessons learned from implementation. First, the importance of an institutional collaboration is very important to have cooperation with different social trade union stakeholders, each and every part, the improvement of IT systems, the tools that we have, the necessary software, which should be available for everyone. In Colombia, this is a problem, unlike what my Spanish colleague said. In Colombia, we still are struggling to put information available for the use of the different stakeholders. And another important point is related to those issues associated with including underground water into the, let's say, the management of water solutions, particularly 
what uh, has to do with the use of underground water and the joint use of underground water. Here we talk about climate change, climate variability, but also aspects related to the development of the country in terms of food security and energy security. So these are key elements that are challenges, that are lessons learned that we have managed to gather throughout these years. So the issue of underground water has existed in Colombia ever since the 70s, from the Colombian service in Geominas in the past to the current institutions. And in the 90s, there has the was a boom in this sector and the integrated management is a more recent approach in colombia only now are we trying to strengthen monitoring knowledge awareness raising and efficient and sustainable management of our aquifer systems and as you said very well we have around 60 uh, aquifer systems that are recognized so to put it in percentage terms, they account for 15 to 20 percent of the water potential of Colombia. We have a long way to go that will only be attained with institutional strengthening collaboration that is effective among regional entities and national entities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. And after these rounds of questions, I think that this is the time for us to draw some conclusions. We are close to complete and conclude this session. So maybe I would like to listen to you for one minute each so that our audience from Spain and Latin America can get some key message that you may consider important in terms of aquifer management and sustainable management, because we have seen different realities with different problematics, varied uh, outlook of uh, use related situations. Underground water is key to supply people. In other cases, the aquifers are more a supplementary resource, but I would like to emphasize the importance that you placed on the planning stage and how planning with a view to the mid and long term with a strategic view can open the door for useful actions to finally meet the needs of the realities. So for this minute of conclusions, I would like to listen to following the order of presenters, if you will. Uh, Victor, you're first. Any conclusion that you could share with us from Conagua? Thank you very much. I would like to point some aspects, the participation of specialists from various disciplines is quite relevant today in terms of water. I remember 30, 40 years ago, maybe it was a matter of engineers, but today it has to do with various disciplines. Even the civil society has also been involved and that led authorities in this case, the authorities from the city of Mexico and the state of Mexico give a lot of importance to this topic and it's quite relevant for governments everything that has to do with water and for society as a whole because it might have more incidence in society to give value to water because for many years we did not give the value we should have and today with the pandemic also it has quite high relevance for the country, for society, and for the future of all our countries. Thank you very much, Victor. Also, with this last conclusion, half a minute, Teodoro. 
Well, I think that uh, these waters have a fundamental value, but this is a resource that if we don't treat it the right way, then it will be very difficult to recover, both in terms of over exploitation and in terms of amount. The recovery of aquifers is not easy. Therefore, I would say they are really very important in order to uh, supply the needs of water, but we need to preserve the good state. Thank you very much, Teodoro. And finally, Victor, one last remark. Omar. Omar, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think that in half a minute, let me highlight the importance of cooperation in order to look for spaces of shared knowledge. Second, the need for institutional articulation inside countries, because many times institutions do not speak to each other and visions might differ. And third, the necessary dialogue in terms of underground waters, the intersectoral dialogue, but as uh, our colleague from Mexico was saying, the interdisciplinary dialogue also very necessary for the right and sustainable management of aquifer systems in the nation and across boundaries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you very much also, Deodoro, and thank you very much, Omar, for all your conclusions and remarks that you've provided this afternoon and this morning in Latin America. Thank you very much to the three of you. And this panel uh, has concluded. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Moder Moderator Jorge Conche, and also Victor Burge Teodoro Mar Vargas for his excellent exhibition about the challenges and actions that you have to face from your very important uh, institutions. It's been a pleasure to see all the efforts in order to make the most of aquifers as well as the protection and restoration. Before we move on, let me remind you that you have simultaneous translation to Portuguese and English available. If you are following us from the CAF.com web, you have buttons below the, rep the player. And if you follow us in YouTube, you can access uh, in the chats to the three different emissions in Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Now we should move on to the second session of this water dialogues in between Latin America and Spain organized by CAF. To do so, we will have a panel that will help us understand the importance of governance and hydro diplomacy in transboundary aquifers. Let me then invite the members of the panel, starting with the moderator, Manuel Menendez, advisor to the Cabinet of the Secretary of State for the Environment and Vice President of the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program at UNESCO. Also with us are the following guests, Laura Movija, Professor of Public International Law at the University of Vigo in Spain. Ms. Mr. Menendez and Mrs. Movija are here in this room. And remotely, let us greet Gerardo Amarilla, and the Secretary of the Ministry of the Environment of Uruguay and President of Ceregas, and Ricardo Andrada, Advisor to the Presidency of National Water Agency in Brazil. So, Mr. Moderator, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon here in Madrid, and good morning in most of the other countries. Let me start by thanking CAF, the Development Bank for Latin America, for allowing me to be present here. And apart from that, to be able to share with the other colleagues information and experience, in this case, about underground water. And let me also say that I would also like to congratulate you on choosing this topic. It has already been said that, unfortunately, underground water has somehow been quite invisible and concealed by surface water, and this sort of actions will probably make it more visible. So 
that uh, separation between in ground and underground water is quite shallow. It's artificial. In fact, uh, water is the same. Hydrological cycle is uh, just one cycle. And if it's uh, superficial or groundwater, then it will become underground water. So we should also consider that. Honestly, we've seen that the management of underground water is quite complex. This is a management that demands knowledge, first of all, on aquifers. It also demands governance measures for better management. It also demands uh, an implementation of measures that has a series of impacts going beyond environmental impact. It also has economic and social impacts. And if this is complex in a local aquifer, you can imagine how complex it will be when we talk about transboundary aquifers to begin with. We talk about aquifers where many times it is not even simple to assign part of the aquifer to one country or the other aquifers normally and underground water we don't have these concepts of upstream waters or downstream waters that we do have in basin so i think that it's wonderful to hold such a round table as this one and that we also have uh, participants so important as the one that have already been introduced let me repeat to you, we will have uh, the president of Sergas. It is a category two center for UNESCO to manage underground water. We'll also have a manager, Ricardo Andrade. He works at the National Water Agency in Brazil. He will also offer us his experience in the practical management of these aquifers. And we have a researcher next to me, Laura Movisha. She's a professor at the University of Vigo of public international law and she will give a very interesting vision because I think that she has broad experience and has really made a lot of efforts to everything related with management and hydro diplomacy in the management of underground water so if it's okay with you and with no further ado let me begin with a question that will be kind of that, that will be for the three participants. It's already been said. In terms of water resources, we've always had problems that have to do with diffuse pollution, but also other problems that have to do with overexploitation when demand is greater than resources. But these are problems that with climate change are being worsened. These are problems that we will see in the future and will see more impact. So in that sense, the governance that we make of aquifers and underground water for these resources is very important. So my first question, which is common to three participants, is what are the key factors that you see and should be considered for a better governance and more sustainable governance of underground water? And let me begin with Gerardo Amarilla, president of Sergas who, as I was already mentioned, he's also under secretary of the Ministry of Environment for Uruguay. So, Gerardo, you have the floor. We need to manage, coordinate, and solve conflicts and underground in superficial waters. I was checking some examples where while in the 18th, 17th century in very important uh, basins in Europe and in North America, and we have very little experience or tradition in shared management of underground water. As they are not seen, we think that whatever we drill, whatever is down there is ours, and that's it. And I think that we are in a century and in a time that give us important challenges in order to understand that we are mere managers of water resources that are close to us. and. We cannot have an absolute sovereignty of national states 
as we did in the past on those resources which are shared and what is being affected or is been done in one side might affect another one that we overuse on one side will be more scarce on the other side and we have an important responsibility of having a sustainable and responsible management but also give way to an environment of coordination maybe in this region in latin america here in the southern cone we are on the Guarani Aquifer system, which is one of the most important underground freshwater systems shared by Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. And with so much water availability, superficial water availability in that area, there's a large volume of wealth in terms of quality and quantity of superficial water. We have not pushed so much on the resources of underground water. So this exploitation has been somehow delayed. And this was also mentioned by other panelists. Also the fact that when you exploit underground water, you also generate certain vulnerabilities or risk of potential negative impact in terms of pollution by generating a more fluent communication between the surface and the underground. And fundamentally speaking, in our region and in this uh, Guarani aquifer system, this has not yet happened. So there we mostly have an acceptable system for underground water that is important to preserve and maintain. We also have an important degree, and we should recognize this, of ignorance in terms of the operation and system and dynamics of those underground waters. We know they are there. We know the more or less the limits and the volume, but we lack a lot of knowledge and research on the operation of the dynamic of this large reserve of underground freshwater reserve. Also, some problems with the contamination, especially in the most superficial areas where we have sand. There is some alert about uh, pollution, specifically of anthropic origin, some nitrates, and also and the existence of some harmful elements like arsenic, which is present in some volumes that are larger than those allowed naturally in some parts of the aquifer. But uh, specifically, we do have there uh, water quality, which is quite important. And it's very good quality, and we do have the responsibility of preserving that and generating uh, joint work programs among countries in order to guarantee the quality and the sustainable use. Thank you very much, Gerardo. That problem that you were talking about, I mean, the complexity of knowledge in terms of underground water in order to plan for the proper measures is an important problem that it also, uh, we might insist a little bit more on that in another question. But I want to convey the same question to our colleague from Anna Brazil. What are the governance factors that you consider key factors for a good management? of a transboundary aquifer. Good afternoon to everyone. I would like to highlight two fundamental aspects. First, knowledge. With no knowledge on the characteristics and potentialities of the aquifer or any other water reserve, it would not be possible to promote a transboundary governance that is correct. Also, let me highlight the fact of sharing information and experience 
This is very important, otherwise it would not be possible to promote monitoring and uh, management of water uh, resources. Brazil, through ANA, has managed to strengthen the relations with neighboring countries, broadening that very important knowledge and also sharing information provided in order to improve uh, the different instruments, considering the specificities of the institutional legal aspects in Brazil, where we do have federal waters, state waters. We exercise this uh, transboundary management daily between relations among the federal states in Brazil and the central state. Another thing that I will also like to highlight is the Brazilian geographical position in terms of uh, uh, in relation to our neighbors in the northern area, in the Amazonia uh, basin. We are uh, receivers and in the south we have Paraguay and Uruguay and others and we donate so this specificity imposes on us the responsibility of acting in a balanced manner always looking to collaborate in order to offer a better and proper transboundary management. Brazil takes part in several initiatives and let me underpin what was already mentioned. The Guarani Aquifer System, the Sig Plata, and also something which will be a topic for our next intervention, the uh, Amazonic Amazonia Basin Aquifer that has the participation and the leadership of the organization of the Amazonia Treaty that comprises eight countries in the basin. We develop actions in order to strengthen the institutional framework of countries to plan and execute strategic actions that are seeking for protection and integrated management of water resources with a regional view and with a transboundary view. So it is important to mention here that those actions are being financially supported by the GF, Global Environmental Facility, within the Jeff Amazonia uh, project and by the government of Brazil, the National Water Agency, within uh, the National Water Agency project, or the cooperation agency and TCA. So I believe that, as was already said in the previous panel and also in this panel, knowledge and sharing and doing research are fundamental aspects in order to conduct a sustainable and proper management of water resources in an equal and safe manner. And this is what I would like to say in this first presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And you said it for yourself. I am a technical expert. So in general, we think about the knowledge of aquifers from a geological perspective, multi-layer. But as you mentioned very well, and I'm sure that Laura is going to talk about it also, the administrative knowledge of the aquifer per se. So are we talking about transboundary aquifers? What about the different laws, the legislative framework of the sharing countries? So Laura, the question is the same for you. From your more legal perspective, what are those governance factors that would allow us to move towards let's say, a more sustainable and more equitable development. Development. Can we define the notion of equitable development in these transboundary aquifers? Thank you, Manuel. 
Good morning, good afternoon to all, and thank you, Kath, for uh, sharing this event with me, which is very necessary to be able to talk about such an important topic. It's quantita quantitative and um, qualitative importance as aquifers have. So in relation to your question, I will reiterate what my colleagues said in their presentations or Neno Kukuric, for instance, in his presentation. The key factor is knowledge, knowledge that has been mentioned by everyone. And the lack of knowledge in many cases of the characteristics of an aquifer to the location of the aquifer. Is it a shared aquifer? The quantity, the quality of the water, the dynamics of the water, not knowing those aspects unfortunately explains for and accounts for the lack of transboundary regulation that exists. Mr. Kukuric said we cannot monitor what we don't know, so we won't be successful in regulating something that we don't know. So knowledge is key. And in some concrete cases where states want to cooperate, but that knowledge is not enough, then the cooperation should focus on joint activities, a joint data sharing mechanism and other instruments. So if we consider, and I know that it's little of uh, the number of agreements on aquifers that exist, but these are very heterogeneous aquifers, there is something that most have in common, and it is the establishment of some mechanism or institution to exchange data and information. Of course, um, continuous monitoring is the purpose of an aquifer. So this exchange of knowledge is key, is vital in relation to such an important resource and will always be the first step, step and the basis for joint and efficient cooperation. And from there, we have other international legal instruments, the International Commission in 2008, the right of transboundary aquifers. This document was backed up by the UN, but also the model guidelines in the framework of the UN for Europe on transboundary underground waters that establish guidelines for states so that they design the legal framework that best suits and fits the specific characteristics of each aquifer. So aquifers, as you know, have specific water features, political, geopolitical characteristics. So these instruments are the basis for states to adapt these uh, general rules to their specificities. So in this sense, the existence of an agreement or institutional mechanisms uh, does not ensure an effective cooperation in practice. However, it can facilitate it. And it is true that we have more and more good practices and parameters in order to design effective institutional mechanisms. For example, in the context of the Sustainable Development Agenda of the UN, one of the indicators of SDG 6 offers the parameters to know what an operational agreement is. So there should be minimum aspects, a joint establishment, for example, holding regular meetings, establishing joint plans with common objectives, and of course, exchange of data and information on an annual basis. Good, so if uh, it's okay with you, we are going to start touching on some practical cases, as Laura just mentioned, how key 
know with the aquifers is, and for the Guarani aquifer, which is an especially complex aquifer because it is shared by four countries. So, uh, Dr. Maria, we would like to know your experience because you have an ambitious um, project to exchange data. So I would like to know more of these. What are the expectations of this project? In the region, we started a very interesting uh, effort from 2003 and 2009 that finally gave the way to an environmental project and sustainable development for the Guarani Aquifer. This was a project that included studies, research with technical experts and the support of the OECD and the OAS working with the four countries in order to finally get to August 2010 to the signature of a regional treaty between the four countries, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And so only this year, after a long 10-year process, was ratified by the parliament in order to be effective. So it took effect this year, the Guarani Aquifer Treaty. So this creates a very important possibility because this project for environmental protection first called for the gathering of basic knowledge of the reserve, of the main characteristics, the threats and vulnerabilities of the area, the approximate volume of resources that we have, how we use those resources, what the aquifer means in each country. In Uruguay, its location is very important. It accounts for 23% of the territory. And in Brazil, which is like a continent country, the presence of the aquifer is really, really small compared to the huge size of the country. So we are trying to see how these realities combine. We were also able to gather knowledge related to different aspects for border points that were implemented in order to raise awareness among citizens, among the populations in the area, and raise awareness about the risks and vulnerabilities of underground waters. So this project for environmental protection had as a result increased knowledge of the system, but also the main delivery or deliverable was the strategic action plan, including general recommendations for the countries, particularly in the legislative aspect, in the institutional aspect, and also recommendations related to the protection of this resource. So the document of the agreement uh, talks about improving efforts, coordinating our efforts, and finally, uh, talk for the consensus among the countries, uh, the importance of working together in order to have the best use of the aquifer for our people, our societies, our countries in a sustainable manner. And the sustainability notion, uh, not only from the solidarity perspective, as we may think, uh, not only the generational importance that it entails, but also the intra-generational importance that it has, including all these uh, populations that are part of this resource. So right now, we are starting the second stage of the Guarani project. We are starting Guarani 2. We just signed a, an agreement and the funding on the part of CAF 
for this project with the participation of the regional center for underground waters, which is this center that I made reference to and we made reference to before. So this is very important because this center is located in the heart of the aquifer with the support of UNESCO and with this CAF funding to start this second stage, which is so important towards clear, concrete objectives and decisions, landing these ideas that we talked about, about the shared governance of the underground aquifer. We are going to land all these concepts to work together for the future to see how each country with increased knowledge, which is fundamental, with increased research, which is necessary, but also with an increased commitment of the countries to move together towards sustainable management, which is what we need to preserve this important resource, important for the region, important for us. But also, I believe that it is uh, very important for mankind. Thank you very much, Gerardo. And I have another question, similar question for Ricardo Andrade for the Amazon aquifer in this case. And I know that Brazil has conducted detailed studies of uh, underground resources and superficial resources. And I'm curious, how have you coordinated these resources? Because this is one country working with other countries, right? On this transboundary resource uh, aquifer. So how are you going to coordinate this in the future? How are you approaching these problems in the case of the Amazon aquifer? Thank you very much for your question. Very relevant. Based on our experience and the Amazon project that I mentioned before, and with the development of the uh, organization for Amazon cooperation, we try to make management of the transborder and superficial resources to create more knowledge, more information sharing, but above all, trust. And at the same time, we were involved in other projects in the Amazon basin. And at that time, we studied we conducted studies in the Amazon basins, particularly limited to the Brazilian area. Our experience that was successful, in particular, the transboundary management with the gathering of all these countries in the transboundary management, superficial management, in the preparation for the aquifer studies was established with results that among others include the creation of an Amazon aquifer project that comprehends and encompasses all the countries in the area. So we used and took hold and took advantage of the relationship that we had of the two TCA, we presented the initial proposal for the countries, the member countries, and we carried out the preliminary studies. This is how we work in general. And the most important thing is that all the expected results of the Amazon aquifer project, all those results were widely discussed and were presented by the countries of the basin. And here I would like to emphasize that it is necessary in order to have an efficient management of the water resources, not just the underground resources or not just the superficial resources, but both considering that water is only one, considering that in many cases, aquifers respond uh, for more than 50% of the of the water in the rivers 
increasing and enhancing transboundary cooperation. However, we still need to consolidate the base of knowledge for a sustainable management and not just in the Amazon area, area, but all the resources, water resources that are available and accessible. This is very important, accessible resources for the population. So we also need to develop a strategic initiative for the underground waters. And we are working now on these, on the Guarani Aquifer, with the purpose of gaining a strategic action for the Amazon system. And we are also trying to consider more technical, scientific, institutional aspects and also financial aspects because we really need financing, legal aspects. We need law institutions and the right legislative framework for the appropriate sustainable management aspiring towards its resilience and capacity to confront and deal with climate events and extreme events. And I would like to finally take this opportunity to share with you that this initiative would not have such successful results without the important participation of, I would say, of the organization of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty. And also the important participation of the technical institutions and the diplomacy of all countries. We would not move forward successfully if we not only involve the technical bureaucracy, but also the diplomacy required to finally align each and every aspect of national sovereignty in a way that we can share in a more efficient manner uh, our waters. Thank you. Thank you very much, my friend Andrade. And as a last question to Professor Movilia, I have the feeling that there is a transformation in the management of transboundary aquifers in the sense that waters seem to be sovereign waters in the country. In the past, the countries would have their waters, they would manage their own waters, but now we see a joint perspective, a more shared management. So what is your perspective, uh, Laura, in relation to this? And do you know of any success story, success case? Yes, and in this context, it's important to emphasize that it is true that states now have the tendency to emphasize concepts such as sovereign use, appropriation of aquifers in relation to superficial waters. And this is explained by factors such as when we talk about aquifers, we not only talk about underground waters, which is a, a fluid resource, it's flowing, uh, in a more slowly manner than the superficial water. And we can consider those specificities, but aquifer also refers to the geological formation and the water contained in. So it's something that could be debatable, the subsoil, the underground aspects. So there is more attachment to sovereignty in these cases. And it, this invisibility of the resource as was mentioned before during this uh, seminar, all these uncertainties around this resource make states uh, more um, reluctant to accepting involvements uh, or interventions into their territories. Anyways, even though all that is true, there is growing consensus around the fact that this sovereignty should be combined with the interest of the states and also with the obligation to cooperate 
with the other state with which the aquifer is shared. So there should be exchange of data, making a sustainable and equitable use of the water. Damage should be avoided when sharing the waters. So within that context, the guidelines that I mentioned before of the International Law Commission on Transboundary Rights or the UN Economic Commission for Transboundary and Underground Water. These are the guidelines that uh, group the standards, which actually are an adaptation of the big principles in this sector, but now more adapted to the specificities of underground waters and aquifers so that states can use them as a guideline. And in a broader sense, all these initiatives for hydro diplomacy and cooperation between the states and the peaceful solution of these conflicts are based on these basic standards of cooperation, sustainable approach, prohibition of transboundary damage. And so the idea is that the states and the actors involved in the management of these aquifers start applying those uh, instruments. And there are two experiences actually that are very interesting con considering the little experience that we have in transboundary aquifer cooperation and one story is that if we consider the few cooperation frameworks that exist, most of them were created with a project, a project behind, with the purpose of increasing knowledge and promoting cooperation. So many projects were mentioned, the Guarani project, the Amazon project, so on and so forth. So all these projects, in most cases, had external investments or donors. So this highlights how in this sector where technical studies are so important to know aquifers have a high cost and how important international cooperation is in order to promote transboundary cooperation. And the second element that I would like to emphasize is that if we consider the few cooperation frameworks that exist, particularly in these uh, transboundary aquifer systems, it really surprises us that many of those frameworks have not adopted the legal form of international treaties. And so this goes against the usual uh, management of rivers or superficial waters, where in those cases, the legal instrument is an international treaty. And this has some advantages. The main advantage is that it supposes or represents a not very costly action for states to take one first step in cooperation. We don't have so much experience compared to superficial waters. So these informal agreements that may exist could promote states to take that first step in cooperation uh, compared to other more formal treaties. And then the other advantage is that these can be adopted not only by states, but by other bodies or entities. And there are examples of joint management agreements or information exchange agreements adopted by local water agencies on each side of the borders. So that is possible too. And those local authorities, those local agencies, which are directly involved in the management of the aquifers and are highly interested in promoting this cooperation, are in a better position sometimes than the central states. Because at central state, sometimes the cooperation may be hard. So. In that case, we see several successful examples. There is another example of agreements between local entities or also the border between the US and Mexico, for example. In that case, a possible treaty between the states 
on water would be more complicated. However, it seems to be easier at local level and it works. And also in the Guarani aquifer, again, at local level, there is an informal letter of understanding between the cities of Salto in Uruguay and Concordia in Argentina. So they are able to manage their underground uh, issues. There are some other examples. I believe that this is very important to gain experiences and lessons learned that not necessarily go through the formalities of an international treaty. Thank you. Thank you. We are actually um, ending this uh, panel. So to conclude, I would like to invite you to a meeting that there is in December 6, 9. And this is the Interna International Sharing Agreement Resources um, meeting. In this international conference, we are going to organize UNESCO together with CODIA. We are going to organize a special session, particularly on transboundary aquifers in Latin America. So you are invited 6 to 9 of December. You can find it on the internet. This will be a virtual meeting. So you can attend from your computers. So thank you very much to these presenters. Thank you very much to all participants who've been listening to us. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Gerardo. Thank you very much, Gerardo Amarilla, Ricardo Andrade, Laura Movilla, and the moderator, Manuel Menuendez, of course, for this very rich vision about the role of water in culture and environment in our planet. It's very important, the fact that we need to continue with research, cooperation, coordination on a resource that recognizes, in many cases, no geopolitical borders. Before we move on to the last session of this uh, water dialogues, let me tell you that you might have the highlights on hashtag Dialogos del Agua and also with Agenda CAF and IAGUA um, social networks. You can also see the videos of the presentations and panels of the sessions in CAF.com and IAGUA.S uh, sites. Now we'll move on with the last uh, session with conclusions and closing remarks. We have Julian Suarez Migliose, Vice President of Sustainable Development with CAF. Mr. Suarez, you have the floor. So good afternoon, Spain. Good morning, Latin America and the Caribbean. It's great honor for me to give a closing remarks to very fruitful seventh water dialogues between Spain, Latin America and the Caribbean, Amins of CAF. And in this particular moment, in the seventh edition, in order to address something so relevant as is that of underground water. I think that it has been made quite clear along these two panels and also along the magisterial presentations and the introduction of the third vice president and minister for the ecological transition and demographic challenge, as well as uh, president of GAF and the secretary of economy, the relevance that these underground waters that, among other things, explain 50% of water consumption for humans, but also 43% of the total amount of water used for irrigation, for agricultural production, and a third part for industry waters. 
but as a common denominator of some conclusions, and I've been uh, taking some notes very actively, but I tried to summarize my main conclusions. Let me say that the key here is how to make the invisible visible. These waters for being underground are in fact invisible. And many times that leads to management problems, which is what calls to this dialogue, to this reflection between uh, Spain, Latin America, and the Caribbean with CAF to better understand how to manage this underground vital resource that on the other hand represents 30% of fresh water in the world. Uh, situations of over exploitation many times linked to the knowledge of uh, the, the lack of knowledge of this underground water and since they're not measuring in terms of quality or quantity the level of pollution they might lead to processes of over exploitation that are many times more accelerated than the capacity of refill that these aquifers might have also in Spain the general water director talked about the problem of the pollution of some or contamination of some specific aquifers here in Spain as a product of uh, fertilizer-based agricultural production, fertilizers that are not well treated many times and therefore end up contaminating this vital source of water, which is many times invisible. But apart from this Spanish problem in Latin America and the Caribbean, urbanization processes that have been so much accelerated and are also supported by the vulnerability of the situations in citizen Latin America and the Caribbean, acknowledge that today waste waters, household waters still have a significant gap in terms of treatment. And this makes these untreated waters that represent 66% of the total amount of waste water in Latin America be discharged in, uh, in untreated away, uh, water masses. Or, for example, in the mining industry where there is no sound regulation or monitoring that is not, uh, that does not meet a robust uh, regulation that also generates, in the end, some contamination problems. And last, and this was also mentioned by many panelists, climate change. This climate change that has been uh, mentioned so much that would also call us in CAF. Uh, as well as the uh, Spanish um, agenda and the Minister for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge. And the idea is to make CAF into the Green Bank of Latin America and the Caribbean. But this climate change also generates uh, an important variability in the hydrological cycle of water. And it also impacts or has an impact to understand how the rainfall regime will be altered and therefore the refill of this aquifers and the groundwaters. So very briefly, let me highlight some remarks made. The president of CAF was recently to CAFIS on September 7th, Sergio Díaz Granados. He shared his remarks about the strategic importance of prioritizing an integrated management to water resources within a context of a growing water stress. And he says, uh, he said that in the last 20 years, the events of floods in Latin America and the Caribbean have increased by 80% in terms of frequency. But we also know that uh, in terms of their intensity has also significantly increased. And this call for turning CAF into the Green Bank of Latin America and the Caribbean, this agenda has a lot of implications, not only from the point of view of substantially increasing the funding of CAF to support a stakeholding countries favoring an environmental and climatic um, sustainability agenda, but it also implies in terms of this uh, water resource to have a water agenda that is in line with the capacities of the resource in order to move forward towards a climate resilience agenda in order to uh, move forward with an adaptation agenda that is so necessary for Latin America and the Caribbean. Let me say that for the future, and we've been mentioning this in different spaces, next year, 
in the eighth edition of Water Dialogues, we will be working towards the Green Bank for Latin America and the Caribbean and CAF, but also in terms of sustainability agendas for Spain in also what has to do with circular economy, which is so much needed for Latin America and the Caribbean in this integrated management of water resource. The third president, Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge, uh, Teresa Rivera, she highlighted the relationship between water, biodiversity, and human conform. That's the balance we should be aiming at. That's how we should emphasize the Spanish, Latin American, and Caribbean uh, collaboration. While the Minister of Economy, on its part, who also was part of the opening uh, remarks, he also highlighted that MOU that has been ratified to consolidate this cooperation agenda between Latin America and the Caribbean, and he underpinned the need to exploit that cooperation, the role of that cooperation, by having greater integration and investment projects that are being financed or co-financed eventually by CAF and the Spanish cooperation. Cristian Asinelli, our corporate vice president of strategic programming, apart from ratifying what was said in the opening remarks and also referring to the three main threats of underground waters, over exploitation, diffuse pollution, and climate change. He also highlighted the dampening uh, capacity of underground waters in terms of the uh, climate change. And this is fundamental for Latin America and the Caribbean. And he also mentioned the project that is being implemented between CAF, the uh, World Environmental Forum, and as an example to be emulate, emulated of efforts of coordination and hydro diplomacy in order to better manage an aquifer, which is one of the three largest reserves of fresh water as the Guarani Aquifer. The very important exposition of Dr. Neno Kukuric, director of the IGRAC, in UNESCO uh, offered a global perspective of underground water uh, showing the relevance of these resources for the diverse use of waters, important role for preserving ecosystems and the possibility they offer as a dampening measure to climate change. He also indicated that it's fundamental to have a legal framework that will allow us to have long lasting agreement among countries, but also he alerted about the need to have systematized information that will allow for a good management and governance of these resources, which will enable the prioritization among different activities in line with better managing these underground waters. Now, moving on to specific sessions, two very interesting panels. The first session specifically dealing with underground, local underground waters, and also presented this question about how to make the invisible visible, which was very well moderated by Jorge Concha. I would say that the common denominator panelists answered to the need of having updated and systematized information on aquifers based on a systematic monitoring as a, an essential support in order to define in the strategies and policy guidelines for the management and governance of this um, underground water uh, systems. Victor Burguet, General Director of the Valley of Mexico Basin Agency, shared in first hand the problems that they have at the Valley of Mexico in terms of the impacts due to the over exploitation of that aquifer. And he also indicated how from the regional water program they're working in order to counteract those phenomena, specifically aiming at protection and rescue of aquifers. Let me highlight that apart from surveillance and control actions, Victor Burguet referred to the fact that there will be some study being conducted in order to determine the highest point of infiltration and so uh, 
um, solve the problems. The water general director, Teodoro Estrella, shared that 40% uh, of Spanish aquifers are not in good conditions. That specifically means that they're not in good conditions due to diffuse pollution, which is consequence of the inadequate use of fertilizers as a result of agricultural production. Let me highlight that he also uh, mentioned a possibility for better planning the water management. The Undersecretary Omar Vargas from Idiam in Colombia shared the Colombian experience saying that there is a very significant challenge ahead in Colombia because we only know about 30% uh, of national aquifer systems. And he also mentioned that environmental management plan for aquifers when they end up in union uh, agreements and call for the participation of all players, including civil society and economic players that are part of aquifers, those management plans can be made effective in order to manage these underground waters. And he also praised the role of communicators in order to convey the main challenges in terms of managing these waters. In the second session, that had to do with governance and hyper diplomacy in transboundary aquifers. Let me specifically highlight as a common denominator that these underground waters that no no geopolitical borders and apart from facing the complexities of uh, underground waters per se, they also have to face the problems of geopolitical aspects and other problems like uh, cultural differences, socioeconomic differences. So this makes the management of these waters much more complex. Without knowing this sort of aquifers, it would not be possible to promote joint spaces of work that was mentioned today to favor governance of transboundary aquifers that is consequent with their sustainable management. The Yandos Secretary of Uruguay, Gerardo Amarilla, uh, also in his role as a president of Ceregas, this regional center for the management of underground water with whom CAF is working and for the Guarani Aquifer System, allowed us to know firsthand the progress made uh, with the agreement, the management agreement, uh, signed by the four countries that are part of this treaty, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and also uh, gave us some idea about a second agreement in order to move forward and land, as he said, in this uh, shared management solution for this aquifer, which is so important for South America. Ricardo Andrade, advisor to the presidency of National Water Agency in Brazil, shared with us the case of the Amazonas aquifer, very complex one, and among other things, also given the no regulatory definition in terms of jurisdiction for the use of ground and underground waters of a federal government such as the Brazilian one. He also mentioned the important progress by some of the studies conducted by Brazil, and in turn, he highlighted the progress made in the last few times to solve a multi-level governance for managing this so relevant transboundary um, aquifer. Uh, Professor Laura Novija, and I will conclude with this, professor at the University of Vigo, she also informed us about the common administrative regulations for transborder regulations, and she highlighted that there is a trend for states to emphasize sovereign use and appropriation use in terms of groundwaters, because when we talk about aquifers, we mean the geological formation and the water contained in it. As she said, let me conclude by saying, and to conclude, that it's really been very important for us to hold this seven water dialogues within a context that specifically for Latin America and the Caribbean and the world in general and the reign of Spain. 
the Kingdom of Spain uh, also uh, has been quite complex, but the conviction on the effort to work in all of this agenda for the management of a water resource has made it possible for this encounter in this modality. Let me uh, thank the Kingdom of Spain, also the Ministry of Economic Affairs and uh, Digital Transformation and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation for their permanent support to CAF and Latin America and the Caribbean around this very relevant agenda for the sustainable development of Latin America and the Caribbean. Also, let me highlight the joint work for the coordination of waters in CAF and the general direction of waters in Spain in order to deploy the agreements that under this MOU are being developed. And these are, in fact, very pragmatic solutions that offer technical assistance across cooperation between Latin America, the Caribbean, and Spain. So with no further ado, let me thank you once again to all of you. Thank you for your participation. Greetings to you all. Wish you the best. Alejandro, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Julian Suarez, Vice President of Sustainable Development with CAF. With this intervention, we will conclude the seventh Latin America Spain Water Dialogue. And we want to thank you for joining us. Again, let us thank very especially Europa Press Agency for their support in order to broadcast this event. A warm a uh, greeting on behalf of CAF Development Bank for Latin America.